All right, we've now covered what I generally wanted to discuss when it comes to GPCRs. Obviously, there are a lot of details to add on to what I showed, which I will do in due time, but for the moment, this should suffice us to get good grasp of what is the function of GPCRs. Let's now cover the tyrosine kinase receptors, which are the second main class of metabotropic receptors. Let's start with the structure of these receptors, which are often simply abbreviated to RTKs. RTKs are rather different from G-protein coupled receptors, as they have only one subunit with an extracellular binding domain. In the intracellular portion of the receptor, it has a kinase domain, and the two domains are connected via a transmembrane alpha helix. As we've learned in the previous section, kinases are a particular set of enzymes that take one of the three phosphate groups of ATP and transfer it on a given substrate. This process is referred to as phosphorylation and it usually leads to the activation or deactivation of the substrate. Examples of substrates can be ion channels, physical proteins, transcription factors, and many more. The phosphorylation is then removed by special proteins named phosphatases. I want to mention as well that this phosphorylation reaction often occurs on tyrosine residues and the receptor itself has a lot of these residues, which explains why it is called the receptor tyrosine kinase. Now, due to the fact that it has these tyrosine residues, the receptor can phosphorylate itself along with other proteins, but we will get back to that aspect shortly. As mentioned earlier, the receptor has a ligand binding site. In contrast to GPCRs that are commonly activated by typical neurotransmitters like dopamine, glutamate, acetylcholine, and so on, RTKs are commonly activated by peptide hormones such as epidermal growth factor, fibroblast growth factor, nerve growth factor, and brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Now, let's see how these receptors get activated. At rest, when the RTK has no ligand bound to it, a good majority of RTKs exist as monomers. When two separate monomeric receptors bind to their respective ligands, it causes dimerization between the two. The formation of the dimer is very important because it will lead each respective RTK to phosphorylate the other RTK until every tyrosine residue has a phosphate group. At this stage, we say that the dimer is fully phosphorylated and fully activated. Now that the RTK is active, it will act as a kinase to other substrates and activate multiple downstream pathways. As you can imagine, since it's a kinase, there's an enormous quantity of possible downstream pathways. One notable pathway that we can consider is actually one that we have covered already, and it is the PIP2 PLC pathway. This is the GQ pathway of GPCRs that I have covered previously, and I suggest you to watch the section on this pathway in the GPCR portion to get more information and more detail about it, but it never hurts to briefly go over this pathway again. So, the main difference simply lies in what activates PLC. In this case, after the RTK dimerizes and becomes an active kinase, it activates PLC, which leads to the subsequent hydrolysis of PIP2 into IP3 and DAG. On one end, DAG leads to the activation of PKC, which is a kinase that then goes on to phosphorylate some substrates in its respective downstream pathways. IP3 leads to the increase of intracellular calcium by opening calcium gated channels in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The entry of calcium can either open more calcium channels or it can bind to a protein named calmodulin to activate another kinase named CAMK. The activation of PKC and CAMK then leads to an increase in phosphorylation that can activate multiple downstream substrates like ion channels, transcription factors, and so on. This is good to know, but it would be obviously more enlightening to cover a pathway that is more a hallmark of the receptor tyrosine kinase. This pathway in question that is famously associated with RTKs is the MAPK pathway. To understand the logic of this pathway, let me first start by describing what MAPK does, and then we'll see how the RTKs relate to it. So first off, MAPK stands for Mitogen Activated Protein Kinase. As it says in its name, MAPK is a kinase, and its main phosphorylation targets are involved in gene transcription, cell growth, cell differentiation, to name a few. To contribute to these functions, MAPK is able to translocate to the nucleus and phosphorylate different proteins, such as transcription factors, that regulate the formation of other proteins that are involved in the cell cycle and cell differentiation. One important aspect about MAPK that is different from other kinases that I've covered like PKA, PKC, and CAMK is that to activate MAPK, it requires phosphorylation. Remember that to activate the other kinases, 
It required the removal of inhibition by regulatory subunits by binding certain molecules to the kinase. Here, it simply requires that MAPK gets phosphorylated. All right, now that we have an intuitive idea of what MAPK does, let's see how it gets activated. So, after dimerization and activation of RTK, a protein by the name of GRB2 comes and binds to a phosphorylated tyrosine. To bind to the phosphorylated tyrosine, GRB2 has a particular domain named SH2 that has the particular sequence that allows it to bind to phosphorylated tyrosines. GRB2 also has two additional domains named SH3 that bind to proline-rich sequences in another protein named SOS. As you can see, GRB2 acts as an adapter protein to link the activation of the RTK to SOS. Now, SOS will then activate a G protein by the name of RAS by exchanging GDP for GTP. In the biology jargon, we refer to SOS as a guanine nucleotide exchange factor, or GEF. Now, RAS is a monomeric G protein. Remember that in our discussion on GPCRs, we covered a heterotrimeric G protein composed out of an alpha, beta, and gamma subunit. Here, RAS is only one subunit, but it nonetheless functions in the same way as the trimeric one. When it is bound to GDP, it is inactive, and when it is bound to GTP, it is active. From this activation, you can notice a rather important difference between RTKs and GPCRs because RTKs do not activate the G protein directly. Indeed, it is the activation of multiple adapter proteins that leads to the switch between GDP and GTP in the G protein, whereas GPCRs directly made the G protein active. All right, now that RAS is active, RAS removes autoinhibition in another kinase called RAF, but this does not fully activate RAF just yet. To fully activate RAF, RAF must dissociate from RAS, and the dissociation is accompanied by the hydrolysis of GTP to GDP. It turns out that RAS G proteins are rather slow at hydrolyzing their GTP. For that reason, additional proteins called GTPAs, activating proteins, also known as GAPs, like RAS GAP, bind to the G protein to facilitate the hydrolysis reaction. If you recall our discussion on GPCRs, this constitutes a rather important difference again with trimeric G proteins because alpha subunits were able to hydrolyze their GTP to GDP by themselves after interacting with their effector proteins. Here, RAS cannot do this hydrolysis quickly on its own, and that is why it needs an additional protein to terminate the signal. All right, now that RAF has dissociated from RAS and is active, it contributes to phosphorylating another kinase named MEC. MEC then links our pathway to MAPK by phosphorylating it and thus activating MAPK. As mentioned, MAPK then phosphorylates and contributes to many downstream signals that are involved in cell growth, differentiation, proliferation, and so on, and their actions often end up being on transcription factors. Now, before we move on, I want to point out a few details on this pathway because this illustration is not fully accurate. So, for the sake of correctness, let me point out a few things. First, it is noteworthy to mention that RAS is generally membrane bound. Secondly, the auto inhibition in RAF is carried out by a small molecule named 1433, and the binding to RAS causes the dephosphorylation of 1433 and the partial activation of RAF. Thirdly, when RAF is activated, it forms a dimer. But, you know, these are small details that you can consider on your own, but in all, the most important points from the MAPK pathway are shown here. All right, now that we have covered the two main categories of metabotropic receptors, let's continue discussing the differences between neurons at the neuromuscular junction and neurons in the central nervous system. The next topic I want to cover will actually cover points 2, 3, and 4 altogether, which are that inputs can be excitatory or inhibitory, that the postsynaptic receptors can be allotropic or metabotropic, and that the presynaptic cells can have different types of neurotransmitters. To cover these points, we will explore the main neurotransmitters as well as their receptors in the central nervous system. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, 
you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.